And so we'll be starting the Sci Sci Olympiad um, uh, Boom Weaver stream. We'll be discussing um, the ins and outs of uh, Boom Weaver. Uh, so do you want to introduce yourself, Kieran? Yeah, um, I'm Kieran. Um, I'm a, a freshman uh, biochemistry student at UT Austin. Um, I've participated in uh, four years of C Division Science Olympiad. And um, in terms of Boom Weaver, I've done uh, boss events all four years as well. Uh, hi, I'm Jason. Uh, I'm a junior at uh, WP High School North in uh, New Jersey, and I've competed in uh, BALSA events as well as other uh, building events. Uh, I've done San Olympiad for, I think, four or five years now. Yeah. Um, okay. okay, so um, about the event rotation for BALSA events. So um, usually uh, the pattern that we see is we see uh, towers, then uh, bridge building, and then elevated bridge, and then boom lever. So right now we're on the boom lever. Um, uh, event rotation and it's been going on for, for since 2018 um, and it is also the balsa event for this year so um, if you look at the pictures the bottom left is uh, the event that's being run this year um so there's uh multiple multiple types of uh there's compression and tension within a boom weaver and so uh compression and tension are the forces that make up essentially um they, they construct what a boom weaver is and how it functions um, so in a typical boom weaver, uh, let's say, uh, can you see my mouse? No, you can't. Yeah. Um, so uh, but typically, you can see that uh, the top of our diagonal portion is the tension part of the boom weaver. And usually the long uh, horizontal portion of the boom weaver is the compression. Uh, and so uh, uh, all boom weaver is, is uh, pretty much uh, optimizing the um, uh, the mass of both the uh, mass and strength of both the compression and tension, and we'll go into um, go more into detail about the design for each of the parts uh, later. Okay, so um, types of grain. So um, typically, uh, people will use balsa for these events because um, it turns out to be the most um, efficient uh, wood, like in a strength to weight ratio um, way of like measurement. Um, but within balsa, there's also different types of grains that you want to be looking for. Um, and different uh, grains will have different qualities and different densities, um, which depending on your needs, um, you may want to pick a certain grain over the other. So it's basically like the way the wood is cut. So, um, so if you look at the, uh, the pictures, you can see how there's like different patterns of grain. Um, and some like in C grain, you can see horizontal and vertical uh, striations, whereas in B grain, you can only see vertical. So Based on that, you can kind of like judge um, what grain it is and therefore um, the, the usefulness of that piece. Um, another thing you wanna be looking for when you purchase wood is defects. So sometimes in a, in a long rod of also, you might see like a knot or something in the wood, which is like a disruption in the grain. Um, and most of the time you wanna be avoiding these pieces because that's a, it's an inherent weak point and um, that's not good for overall strength to weight ratios. Um, Jason, do you want to elaborate on what grains are uh, uh, so for what uses? Typically in the uh, tension, uh, most people, so the tension would be the diagonal piece at the top, in the top right. Um, but so typically uh, people use either basswood and basswood is a slightly, uh, slightly heavier, slightly, slightly dense, uh, denser uh, type of wood. It's uh, more uniform. So it's, uh, people use it because um, it's less likely to like accidentally break. Uh, so uh, typically people use uh, A-green for uh, the tension. But as for the compression, uh, it's always made of balsa. And uh, people can choose between uh, A-green for the um, braces or for the, like, the crosses and uh, C-green or A-green for the, um, C-green or A-green for the uh, compression, like main, main uh, length. Uh, B-green is uh, less useful. It's almost like not used with, uh, within any science event, event, except for maybe uh, flight events such as elastic launch glider. Uh, and I don't think the green is ever used in um, Boom Weaver. Yeah. Uh, so as for tools, so uh, the tools required for uh, Boom Weaver and other boss events are pretty basic. Um, it's really just uh, the materials that you need. So the wood plus uh, exacto knives or razor blades. Uh, so a picture at the bottom right is a, a exacto knife that uh, most builders use and people might use in like school woodworking classes. And uh, so some, and some type of super glue. So uh, commonly it's called cyanoacrylate or super glue. 
Um, it's also marketed as like Gorilla Glue or uh, similar like similar types. Uh, but people use that uh, as opposed to wood glue or other types of glue because it dries quickly and it's a lot stronger than other variants of glue. Um, uh, as for the third point, jigs. Uh, some people use jigs so like to align uh, when the, the align to align the pieces of the boom weaver when you glue and like put everything together. Um, it's up to like your own like personal preference, but uh, you can choose not to use it or you do use it. Uh, and roller, it's obviously a really um, uh, important aspect of uh, your uh, your design, and you should always have one handy to make sure uh, the boom mover is kept within the construction parameters. Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, uh, for the ruler, um, I found in my personal experience that like typical rulers that don't have very fine uh, incrementations um, are not of that much use because in boom weaver the pieces of what that you're working with maybe as um, fine as like three thirty tooths of an inch. So um, when you get a ruler, you want to be looking for fine incrementation, which would increase your precision. And so typically, this wouldn't be like the plastic ruler you find in, like um, like school, like schools or like classrooms. That would be like one of those metal rollers, which may uh, might have might be more durable. Okay, so um, a little bit more on the glue. So. Um, as Jason mentioned, um, typically uh, super glues are like they're basically mandatory. Um, anything other than super glues um, is subpar. Um, and the reason for this is because super glues, um, they, first of all, there's a lot of variation in the, the kinds you can buy. You can get gels or you can get highly um, fluid um, versions and they dry really quickly. So they're easily easy to handle and work with on the, the wood, but they also seep into the grain and create stronger connections. So it's it's really efficient for the weight that it um, adds on. So um, some of the better known brands are like Gorilla Glue. There's also BSI glues that are um, a bit more expensive, but also high quality. Um, and also you can buy these under the name of Cyanoacrylate. That's C, um, CA glue. Um, it's basically just super glue by a different name. Uh, so in a typical boom mover, there's a, uh, there's a variation of, uh, there's all sorts of grains or joints um, so this would be uh, typically when you build a compression, uh, but uh, it could be also used in like the base of the boom weaver or the connection between the tension and compression part of the boom weaver. And so um, when you have uh, typically in a, a normal boom weaver, you would only use lap joints uh, within the compression. And so the reason being uh, butt joints and corner joints don't have as much surface area. So you would always want to use um, some sort of lap joint to optimize the amount of surface area of connection between the bracings and the um, connection, uh, the compression lengths, and so uh, the lap joints would be utilized with, especially within. Yeah, so, like like I said, the um, the axes. So when you connect the two uh, two or four um, compression sticks to the braces, you would just uh, use lap joints. Uh, as for corner joints and butt joints, like uh, especially butt joints, uh, you wouldn't use this at all. Uh, the only the only reason why I could see someone using a butt joint would be when someone is connecting two lengths of compression if their boom weaver isn't long enough. But obviously this is not optimal. You would want like one long stick, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, butt joints and corner joints aren't used. Uh, do you have anything to add? Or no? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so about testing. So um, by testing we mean uh, is like, um, creating iterations of your of your design and testing on your own outside of a competition. So um, uh, basically, whenever you're testing on your own, you want to know exactly what you've changed. So um, what this entails is keeping like a detailed logbook of like uh, the masses of each piece and how much glue you're adding and measuring the the whole structure in between steps in order to see the total mass increase. Um, so you really want to be on control in control of the situation and like know exactly where the mass is. So you know what, um, you can correlate your results to um, some causes. So when you do a test, right? So you're loading in the sand or whatever, the water and um, the structure breaks. So when it breaks, you wanna be recording um, that specific test in slow motion. And uh, most of the time, like I would do this on my phone or something, but uh, the whole purpose of that is to know exactly where the, the breakage point is. And if we know where the breakage point is, we can strengthen, strengthen those joints um, to make sure that they don't break in the future. Um, 
And um, so, yeah, we can, we can uh, see where things are breaking to make improvements, but at the same time, we don't wanna make any drastic improvements. Um, a lot of boom lever testing has to be, um, it has to do with like incrementalism. You can't drastically change your design and hope for a better result because you don't know the variables at play in each part of the boom lever. So it's kind of um, like it's kind of like an experiment in any regular science class. You can't change multiple variables; you only change one and see what happens. Right. Yeah, exactly. So um, you wouldn't be changing the entire compression uh, portion. You would just change a single bracing pattern or a single density or something like that, and then you can use that variable to um, kind of have a better grasp on how your boom lever structure is working out. Um, so yeah, you can test at your school. Of course, if there's a testing apparatus at your school or you could build your own. Um, it's not super expensive and um, it's very doable. Uh, so competition. Uh, so at competition, it's uh, similar to testing, uh, except in many cases, you can't really record your device unless the events riser allows you to. Uh, so one part of uh, the tiebreaker of Boma Weaver is to predict the load. Uh, it's used, yeah, so it's used as a tiebreaker, uh, which it's not, there's commonly like, there's usually not uh, ties, but uh, just in case uh, they have a predicted load. Uh, auto loader versus manual loading. Um, so in the picture on the right, you can see the, uh, the girl uh, uh, scooping the sand into the bucket with a cup. Um, but uh, in a lot of uh, competitive competitions, uh, like for example, MIT or Nationals, uh, they have uh, auto loaders and basically just pull a lever and then like it dispenses sand for you. You can control like how fast the sand moves and uh, everything like that. Um, and so generally auto loaders are uh, better for the boom lever because it dispenses the sand faster uh, and it's more consistent. So if the sand is clumped together uh, and you do manual loading, uh, it's hard to control. But if it's auto loaded, then um, that's uh, easier to control and more consistent. Uh, as with many other building events, goggles is uh, necessary to compete. Uh, goggles are necessary to compete uh, because uh, sand, it protects uh, sand from getting in your eyes. Um, and so you can get disqualified if you don't have uh, goggles. Um, and so the, uh, the role of the second participant is to stabilize the bucket. Uh, usually this isn't needed for auto loaders, but especially for manual loading, you have two sticks I can see uh, uh, in the picture, and uh, they uh, stabilize the bucket. Um, uh, loading sand quick, uh, efficiently and quickly. So yeah, this is uh, only relevant to manual loading. So you want to load the sand like really consistently. You don't want to dump the sand and to exert too much force on the bucket, which would obviously cause a, 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 a earlier failure. Uh, and so yeah, giving the ad for any questions, um, you can. Yeah. Ask questions. Yeah, so, so for like uh, manual loading, uh, most of the time, like what I've seen in the past is people will try to um, like at, at first um, you want to be balancing out the weight in the bucket, like um, because you're doing it by hand, you can control where the sand is falling. So you want to create like a balance um, in the sand as you uh, start off. So most of the time people will start off slow and then they'll start speeding up uh, more and more as they um, progress because um, the longer the boom lever, is, boom lever is under tension, the higher time or higher percentage um, of chance there is for breakage. That also applies applies to auto loaders as well. You want it to go, you want to go slow, then like increase the speed and slow down at the end. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we want to answer a question. Uh, I think the question was, um, let me find it. The question was, what do the rules mean about not being able to, not being able to thrust against the wall, isn't that the point? Um, so the, I think the rules are here. So I think this is what they mean here. Uh, that this attachment must be a pulling force in, for, on the inside radius of the J-bolt. The boom lever may not thrust back against the wall during loading. Uh, and so I kind of drew up like a diagram here. Uh, so uh, if you have the wall here, any of the two tensions on the side, uh, it's basically saying that this, uh, these tensions must pull on the must pull on uh, the um, J hook here and must have a continuous uh, continuous like tension uh, this way, right? Uh, and then at no time could the tension be pushed back uh, this way. Uh, so if the purple piece here, if wait, 
Um, let me switch colors. So if the purple piece here ever uh, has a force against the J no, J hook here, that's not allowed. It's basically saying uh, that this piece always has to have a tangent force exerted on the inside part of this J hook here. Uh, so I hope that answer answers your question. Uh, does anyone else have any questions in about uh, the roles, the any changes in the roles, or anything specific like that? You can ask in the YouTube uh, chat. 